You know, if you were to just go out on the street and start talking to people about heaven and ask them how, you know, if they even believe in heaven, how would they get there? Most people would begin to talk about uh, just being good. They'd say, well, you know, um, you got to just live the best life you can. And hopefully if you live a good life, you know, you'll make it to heaven. And that's such a common belief uh, among our culture. And uh, when you stop and think about, though, what that belief is, that belief is the idea that we are saved, if we can be saved, we're saved by being good people, essentially. If we, if we uh, don't make it to heaven, then obviously the, the scales of our lives tipped the other way on the negative side. And unfortunately, we didn't do enough good things to warrant going into heaven. And therefore, you know, that's, we didn't make it sort of a thing. And this is very, very common. And it's, it's been held by people for many years. And, and it's terrible. I can't imagine a worse way to live then going through my life wondering, gee, I wonder if I've been good enough, you know? But I guess I'm not going to know until the day comes, you know, and I stand before God or whatever, or, or we, you know, are standing before the pearly gates. I don't know where that even came from, sort of a thing, you know? And I don't even have any idea where the whole idea of Peter, you know, being some sort of a, you know, doorkeeper came from. What a dumb idea. But you know what that is, guys? You know what that belief is? That belief is the law. That's the law. The law says, do this, and you're in. Do this, and you're okay. Don't do this, and you're not okay. And the law is very strict. The law is very severe. The law can even be kind of cruel, you know? And... Um, If we've come away with anything from our study of Leviticus, it should be the cruelty and severity of the law. And we see this in the nation of Israel in the way that God established things with them. But, and, and you might be thinking to yourself, wow, what a, what a rotten way for them to live, to live under the law in the sense that they have to keep the law in order to go, go to heaven. But we, it's different for us. You know, we don't have to keep the law because we're not under the law you know, we're, we're under grace. No, yeah, but you have to understand something. Even the Jews didn't go to heaven by keeping the law. No man is saved by keeping the law. When we get into the New Testament, we start looking at the writings of the Apostle Paul. He makes it very clear, particularly in Romans chapter 3, no man is going to be considered righteous or declared righteous by keeping the law. The law won't save you. And what he's saying is being good won't save you. You don't go to heaven by being a good person, period, right? Okay, so we got that out of the way. We know how we do get to heaven. We know that it's by putting our faith in what Jesus did on the cross, believing that his sacrifice was enough. That's how we get to heaven. Jesus was good enough. We're not good enough. When we put our faith in his goodness, we have the promise of salvation. So there, we got that dialed in. So where does the law come in? Well, there's still the severity of the law. And we're going to see it again tonight in our, our study here of Leviticus. We're going to continue to see that God laid down rules and laws and said, these people can approach me, but only sometimes. These people over here, they can't even, they can't approach me ever. You know? And, and, and we're going to see that there were specific things that if people had even wrong with them, physical deformities, they couldn't approach God. They couldn't be in the priesthood, at least not in the sense of approaching the Lord. And we're going to continue to see this limitation of, 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 of access that we've talked about previously in our study of Leviticus. The limitation of access. What that means is you can't just come before God anytime you want to come before God under the old covenant. Why? God is holy. He's a consuming fire. Right? And if you come before God on your own merit or on your own timetable or with your own invitation, you're liable to drop dead in your tracks. And some people did, including Aaron's two oldest sons, when they went before the Lord just because they kind of felt like it. And God said, I'm holy. I'm a holy God, and I will be treated like a holy God. 
And those, those young men, I don't actually know how old they were, but they, you know, they died right in their tracks. God was communicating to the nation of Israel. I am a holy God. You know, this is what we come away with from our study of the book of Leviticus. Now, tonight we're going to see that, and we're going to see some other things as well. We're going to be looking. In fact, let me put kind of an outline, if I can, of what we're going to be viewing tonight in the chapters that we're dealing with. Chapters 21 and 22 are going to be specific directions for those in the priesthood related to uh, how to deal with holy things, how to deal with sacrifices, um, you know, just the proper way that they were supposed to do things. It was very picky, you know? This is another thing about Leviticus. I would have hated being a priest, you know? I mean, it was just so picky. You got to do it just like this and just right, or you could die. And again, this is a reminder of the holiness of God and what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross uh, through his sinless life, you know, now that we can approach God anytime we want. Uh, chapter 23, we're actually going to uh, visit the feasts of the Lord. God is going to go through all of the feasts. And what's interesting about the feasts that God gave to Israel is that we see Jesus in those feasts. You know, those ceremonial observances of the Jewish feasts, they pretty much all point to Jesus Christ in one way or another, uh, as a person, as the Savior, Messiah, and, and what he did for us. And we'll talk about that. And then in the last chapter we're going to deal with tonight, which is chapter 24, we're going to, uh, they're going to talk just a little bit about the daily tabernacle duties as it relates to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lamp, stand. I couldn't think of it there for a second. The golden lampstand and the bread of the presence. And then there's going to be a short narrative in, in the middle of that chapter uh, about um, blaspheming uh, God's name and how they were told to deal with it. So anyway, let's get into it here again. Boy, the severity of the law. Leviticus 21, it says, and the Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron. So who's this directed to? It's to the priesthood. And say to them, no one shall make himself unclean for the dead among the people, except for his closest relatives, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, his brother, or his virgin sister who is near to him because she has no husband. Uh, for her, he may make himself unclean. What does it mean to make yourself unclean? They were not, being around a dead body was enough to make you unclean. Touching a dead body most absolutely would make you unclean. Now, as the priests they had limitations while they were functioning in their role as priests as to, you know, what could potentially make them unclean. And so what happens if a priest is on duty? He's doing his priestly duties, right? And one of his family members dies. Well, they had to have rules about this sort of thing. Why did God focus so much on priests being holy and clean? Well, you got to remember the priest, the high priest particularly, is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, who went not in front of the Holy of Holies built by men, but went into the Holy of Holies, meaning the heaven of heavens, the very throne of God, and poured out his own blood, right, for our sins. Why? So that's why the high priest, you know, had to be clean at all times because Jesus, he's a picture of the sinless Christ. Christ who had no sin, who committed no, you know, uh, no wrong in his entire life on earth and then was enabled by his sinless life to give his life for us on the cross. So the high priest had all of these requirements upon him to maintain this ceremonial, clean sort of a status. And it must have been very challenging. It goes on to say in verse 4, he shall not make himself unclean as a husband among his people and so profane himself. So, and, and again, God is not saying that the priest couldn't mourn when someone in their family died. You can't tell somebody you can't mourn. What they're saying is he's not to make himself ceremonially unclean in his mourning, um, and, and then, of course, that means he couldn't be near or touch that dead person. And, and plus, he must not wear the traditional garb, if you will, of somebody who was in mourning. 
the Jews had special things they would put on, sometimes even sackcloth, when they were expressing attitudes of mourning, or they would rip their clothes to show grief and despair, or put ashes on their heads. These were all symbolic outward symbols of someone who was grief-stricken and in a time of mourning. And, but the high priest, when the anointing oil is on him and he's functioning in his role, he must not do that because he is a representation of the one who is to come, Jesus Christ, who will stand before God on our behalf. Verse 5. It goes on to say, they shall not make bald patches on their heads, nor shave off the edges of their beards, nor make any cuts on their body. What is that all about? Well, that's some of the ways the pagans used to express their mourning. With the Jews, it was putting on sackcloth, dust and ashes on their heads, ripping of the clothing. But pagans used to do different things, literally cutting patches of their hair, cutting the edges of their beard, things like that, cutting their flesh. Um, God is saying, don't be like the pagans, right? When it comes to the expressions of grief that they portray or show uh, when someone near them dies. Um, They shall be holy, he says in verse 6, to their God and not profane the name of their God, for they offer the Lord's food offerings, the bread of their God. Therefore, they shall be holy, all right? Verse 7, they shall not marry a prostitute or a woman who has been defiled. Neither shall they marry a woman divorced from her husband, for the priest is to, uh, is holy to his God. Now, again, this is a, another picture of how the priest represents Jesus Christ. Who's the bride of Christ? It's us. Now, you might say, well, so then why was the high priest not allowed to marry a defiled woman or somebody? I mean, we've certainly been defiled by sin. Yeah, but we've been purified through the blood of Christ. We now have the robe of righteousness, right, through Jesus. And now, this is the crazy thing. God sees us, the bride of Christ, through the blood of the lamb, and there is no stain, there's no wrinkle, there's no blemish upon the bride of Christ. We see our issues. I see my own, and sometimes I can see yours, and sometimes you can see mine, you know? But God sees us through the blood of the Lamb, and there, there's no stain of iniquity in the bride of Christ. And so the high priest was not to take a woman who was anything but a virgin eligible to be married, because again, this is a picture that God is painting for the Jewish people to see and to understand that which is to come, which is Messiah, and so forth, right? Um, Verse 8 says, you shall sanctify him, meaning you shall set him apart, the priest, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord who sanctify you, am holy. And the daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by whoring, profanes her father, she shall be burned with fire. So the responsibility of living that holy life even extended to the priest's family. We have no record of that ever happening. But but this is an expression of God to say that if even if the high priest's daughter should take up prostitution, which of course, you know, is is horrific uh, that there is uh, there are consequences to that chosen lifestyle. Verse 10 says, the priest who is chief among his brothers, on whose head the anointing oil is poured, and who has been consecrated, set apart to wear the garments, shall not let the hair of his head hang loose, nor tear his clothes. Again, signs of mourning. He shall not go into any dead bodies, nor make himself unclean, even for his father or for his mother. He shall not go out of the sanctuary, lest he profane the sanctuary of his God, for the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is on him. I am the Lord. And he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widowed or a divorced woman, or a woman who has been defiled or a prostitute. These he shall not marry. We see we're getting some repetition here. But he shall take as his wife a virgin of his own people, that he may not profane his offspring among his people. For I am the Lord who sanctifies him or who sets him apart. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, None of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish 
may approach to offer the bread of his God. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near a, a man blind or lame or one who has a, a, a mutilated face or a limb too long or a man who has an injured foot or an injured hand or a hunchback or a dwarf or a man with a defect in his sight or an itching disease or scabs or crushed testicles. No man of the offspring of Aaron, the priest who has a blemish, shall come near to offer the Lord's food offerings. Since he has a blemish, he shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. And again, this may sound like some kind of cruel sort of discrimination, but again, this person represents Jesus Christ. This person represents the sinless lamb of God. And God says, let them come with no issues or blemishes. If they, if they are, it doesn't mean they can't serve in other ways. And it doesn't mean they're not going to be taken care of. It just means they can't become a high priest and go in and do the work on the inner, in the inner sanctuary. Um, look what verse 22 says. It says, he may eat the bread of his God. In other words, he can live off the food that comes to the priest's family, both the most holy and of the holy things, but he shall not go through the veil. In other words, into the holy of holies or approach the altar because he has a blemish that he may not profane my sanctuaries for I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So Moses spoke to Aaron and to his sons and to all the people of Israel. All right. So again, you know, the severity of the law, the specific aspects of the, le uh, the legalities of the law. Aren't you glad you don't live under this? Aren't you glad that as priests of God, as priests, you know, that's what the Bible says that we are priests. He is our high priest, but we are priests offering spiritual sacrifices. You know what your spiritual sacrifice is? Remember, it's you. It's you. So do you, do you know of anything in the word of God that forbids any, of the, uh, any believer from coming into the presence of God at any time? I know of nothing. I know of no statement in the word of God related to a born-again child of God that limits access to the Father. I know, I know of nothing, Right? We are all under the blood of the lamb. We have all been forgiven of all of our sins. And it doesn't matter, you know, and if you have these physical deformities or you have this or you have that, it doesn't matter, right? We come boldly before the throne of grace. Oh, what a wonderful thing. Leviticus 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons so that they abstain from the holy things of the people of Israel, which they dedicate to me so that they do not profane my holy name. I am the Lord. Now he's going to talk to them about the offerings that they offer that are brought by the people of Israel. Say to them, if any one of you, or if any one rather of all your offspring throughout your generations approaches the holy things that the people of Israel dedicate to the Lord, listen to this, while he has an uncleanness, the person shall be cut off from my presence I am the Lord. This is God telling, you know, the priests that the, the, the sacrifices they offer are holy to the Lord. And so if a priest were to be unclean because he touched a dead body or because of any number of other things, and then he handles the sacrifices of the Lord, that is a, is a very serious sort of a thing. And he is cut off from the Lord's presence. Uh, it says in verse 4, none of the offspring of Aaron who has a leprous disease, which could include very many sort of skin-related diseases, or a discharge, may eat of the holy things until he is clean. Whoever touches anything that is unclean through contact with the dead, or a man who has had an emission of semen, or whoever touches a swarming thing by which he may be made unclean, or a person from whom he may take uncleanness, uh, whatever his uncleanness may be, the person who touches such a thing shall be unclean until the evening and shall not eat of the holy things unless he has bathed his body in water. When the sun goes down, he shall be clean. And afterward, he may eat of the holy things because they are his food. In other words, they're set aside to him, the priests, uh, because they are of the priest's family, but they may not partake of them during a time of uncleanness. Verse 8, he shall not eat what dies of itself, 
or is torn by beasts or so make himself unclean by it. I am the Lord. They shall therefore keep my charge lest they bear sin for it and die thereby when they profane it. I am the Lord who sanctifies them. All right. Then he goes on in verse 10. I'm going to introduce kind of a new term here. It says, a lay person shall not eat of a holy thing. No foreign guest of the priest or hired worker shall eat of a holy thing. I want you to notice here in the ESV that I'm reading, it uses the, 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 the title lay person. Um, this is one of the rare places where the ESV translators um, chose to use a traditional name uh, rather than what the word literally means. And, and, and frankly, it, I'm a little befuddled by the fact that they did it. The, the Hebrew word simply means stranger. But it's not talking about stranger from the standpoint of I don't know you. It's a stranger from the standpoint that they are not part of the priest's family. All right. Uh, he, he's a stranger to the priest's family. And so he, it's simply saying here, they, they are not to eat the food that is designated for the priest, even if they live with the priest, which could have happened, right? But he says, if a priest buys a slave as his property for money, the slave may eat of it, and anyone born in his house may eat of his food. If a priest's daughter marries a layman, again, there's that term, and really it's literally stranger, someone outside of the family, but the priest's daughter marries that person outside the family, she shall not eat of the contribution of the holy things. Why? Because now she's married to another man who is not of the priest's family, and she is now part of that family. This is a reminder that when a woman leaves her father's home and marries a, a man, she is part of a new family unit. Whereas she was once the daughter of a priest, now she is the wife of a non-priest, if in fact he was not in the priestly line. So now she is ineligible to eat of the holy things because she's now the wife of of another man. So this kind of speaks of that, what happens when people get married. A new family structure is created. I bring that up every time I do pre-marriage counseling with a, with a couple. I tell them, you guys know something more happens when you're married, right? When you say, I do. You're not just, you know, becoming a married couple in that sense of, you know, husband and wife, but you are a new family. A new family is being created on the day you get married. A brand new family, a new family structure, right? The, the, that's why it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother, which is the family structure he was raised in, and he will be united to his wife, and the two become this new family structure, you know, bound up as one flesh in the Lord. So it's, um, you can see how it plays out here, even in the history of Israel. Verse 13 says, uh, but if a priest's daughter is widowed or divorced and has no child and returns to her father's house as in her youth, she may eat of her father's food, yet no lay person shall eat of it. And if anyone, and again, that's stranger, and if anyone eats of a holy thing unintentionally, oops, didn't know that that was part of the food that was for the priest, he shall add the fifth of its value to it and give the holy thing to the priest. And they shall not profane the holy things of the people of Israel, which they contribute to the Lord, and so cause them to bear iniquity and guilt by eating their holy things, for I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and to all the people of Israel, and say to them, When any one of you are of the house of Israel or of the sojourners in Israel presents a burnt offering as his offering, for any of their vows or free will offerings that they offer to the Lord, if it is to be accepted for you, it shall be a male without blemish of the bulls or the sheep or the goats. You shall not offer anything that has a blemish, for it will not be acceptable for you. And when anyone offers a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering from the herd or from the flock, to be accepted it must be Perfect, meaning without blemish, no blemish in it. Animals blind or disabled or mutilated or having a discharge or an itch or scabs, 
you shall not offer to the Lord or give them to the Lord as a food offering on the altar. This is a reminder to give your best because God gave his best by offering his son. You may present a bull or lamb that has a part too long or too short for a free will offering, but for a vow offering, it cannot be accepted. Any animal that has its testicles bruised or crushed or torn or cut, you shall not offer to the Lord. You shall not do it within your land. Neither shall you offer as the bread of your God any such animals gotten from a foreigner, since there is a blemish in them because of their mutilation. Apparently that was pretty common among foreigners. Uh, and they will not be accepted for you. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When an ox or a sheep or goat is born, it shall remain seven days with its mother, and from the eighth day on it shall be acceptable as a food offering to the Lord. But you shall not kill an ox or a sheep or, uh, and her young in one day. And when you sacrifice a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, you shall sacrifice it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten on the same day. You shall leave none of it until morning. I am the Lord. So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. And you shall not profane my holy name that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. All right. So those two chapters on the instructions to the priests. Leviticus 23, we begin to talk about the feasts of the Lord and how they were to be kept. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel. Now, notice that this is now directed to all the people. And say to them, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations or holy gatherings. They are my appointed feasts. And the first thing he covers is the Sabbath. Verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day, uh, it is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation or gathering. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. So the very first thing God talks about as it relates to feasts is the Sabbath, which takes place, of course, once a week. And the Sabbath um, is uh, Saturday. And it began for the Jews sundown on Friday night, and it went until sundown Saturday night. That was the beginning and the end of the day, from sundown to sundown. And the Sabbath was a day of rest, as you see here, and we know that, that uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath for us in that we rest from our work by believing in him and what he did on the cross and so, therefore, by faith, we keep the Sabbath um, as it was intended. Chapter, or excuse me, here, verse 4, it goes on. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. First one, the Passover. In the first month on the 14th day of the month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month, in fact, the very next day is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no ordinary work. And I love Passover because Passover is the picture of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It is that wonderful observance of what God did to release his people Israel from bondage in Egypt when the angel of the Lord went throughout Egypt and put to death the firstborn male of every home, man and animal, but passed over every home where the blood of the lamb was painted literally upon their doorpost. And it's a beautiful picture of how the Jews were saved from death by sheltering under the blood of the lamb. And of course, that's a picture of what we do by faith, by putting our faith in Jesus and his work on the cross. We shelter under the blood of the lamb in the very same way. And it, it's, it's just a, a beautiful picture. So God has them keep the, the Passover by 
sacrificing the Passover lamb on that first night, and then for seven days following is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where they have special sacrifices uh, every day of that week. Then we come to the Feast of uh, First Fruits, and this is on the following Passover's Sabbath, uh, which would be on a Sunday, uh, excuse me, on the, on the day following the, the Passover Sabbath, uh, which is a Sunday. The Israelites were to uh, celebrate the Feast of First Fruits, and here's how it goes. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma, and a drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hin. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain parched or fresh until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And the Feast of first fruits is a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in that he is our first fruits of those who are raised from the dead. So again, a picture pointing to Jesus. Next, we have the Feast of Weeks, also known as the Feast of Harvest. And in the New Testament, this is called Pentecost, after a Greek word that uh, for 50th. It says, you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the, of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days, again, where the word Pentecost comes from, to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs, a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd, and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering, and their drink offerings, a food offering with the pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering, and two male lambs, a year old, as a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap the field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So the feast of ingathering uh, foreshadows the harvest of those who were first brought into the church uh, through the empowering work of the Holy Spirit that fell on the church during the festival of Pentecost in the New Testament. You read it in Acts chapter 2, and you realize that it was during Pentecost, 50 days had been uh, basically counted, since the previous feast, and now you come to the, the, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit falls upon the assembled believers, remember? And the people in Jerusalem are kind of freaked out by what they hear, and they come looking for this noise that they've been hearing, and they find the disciples there, and, and some of them start making jokes about, you know, this and that, because they hear them speaking in other languages, as they're given utterance by the Spirit, and some joke that they're just inebriated, and Peter stands up and says, no, no, these guys aren't drunk. This is actually a fulfillment of a prophecy in Joel. And he begins to speak to them about Jesus. 
And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he gives this incredible message, uh, convicting the people of Israel at the time of sacrificing and, and, and crucifying their Messiah. And it says that many people come to the Lord that day. That's the feast of ingathering. Okay. But it's, it is also connected to the power of the Holy Spirit, which is one of the reasons why churches that focus on the gifts of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, we refer to them as Pentecostal churches because they focus on what took place on Pentecost, which is talked about in Acts chapter 2. Um, it's, it's a term that, I mean, frankly, all churches should be concerned with walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's unfortunate that we've designated that term to describe churches, unfortunately, that have focused even to a place of unhealthy fixation. Um, because we, we all should believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We should all wait upon the power of the Holy Spirit. We should all be looking for the power of the Holy Spirit to do what God's called us to do in the world in which we live. Um, and, and that's what the, the feast of, of Pentecost or in gathering is, uh, is a picture of. Now we come to the feast of trumpets. Uh, the Jews now refer to this as Rosh Hashanah, which it basically just means New Year. It's New Year's Day for them, but this is what it was originally about. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, verse 23 is where I'm reading, and then verse 24, speak to the people of Israel saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation you shall do, not do rather any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering uh, to the Lord. You might say, well, what's the Feast of Trumpets all about? Well, it, you know, it was basically just proclaiming a special, it was kind of a way of proclaiming the coming of the, the next month, which would include some of the most holy days of Israel, including the Day of Atonement, right? Which is a picture, which we'll get to in a moment, of Jesus going before the throne of God and pouring out his own blood on the mercy seat, thereby securing our forgiveness, all right? So this is, um, this is kind of that trumpet saying, it's happening, it's coming. Now we come to the Day of Atonement, or known as Yom Kippur, verse 26. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, now on the 10th day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves, and that's an old way of saying, you shall fast and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is the, a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that day, or whoever does not fast, shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that day, that person will destroy from among, I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. And look what he goes on to say. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. And you shall afflict yourselves or fast on the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening shall you keep your Sabbath. Isn't it interesting? That when the day of atonement comes, which again is that day when Jesus pours out his own lifeblood on the mercy seat of God, God would focus on this issue of do not work. Isn't that incredible? Verse 30 says, whoever does any work on that day, I will destroy from among his people. God says, I will destroy a person who works during that day of atonement. See, again, we are resting in what Jesus did on the cross. When we reject what Jesus did on the cross, when we say, I'm not going to believe that. I don't believe that Jesus died for the sins. I, don't be I believe that heaven is something you attain by being a good person. You just got to be a good person. You got to, you know, you do your best not to lie, cheat, steal, and, all, and, and you just live that good life and that's how you're going to get in. You know what you're doing when you make that decision? You're destroying yourself. 
You are literally destroying yourself. That's what God is saying here. Anyone who chooses to work on this holy day when I have secured salvation, that person will be destroyed because they have rejected God's way of salvation. They've rejected the means by which we are saved by working for their salvation instead of resting. And so he goes on in verse 31 to say, this day will be a solemn day of rest for you. And he makes that emphasis on that solemn day of rest. Christians, this is just a foreshadowing of God appealing to people saying, rest in Jesus. Rest in what he's done for you. Don't work your way to heaven. Oh, I, you know, it's just, you can just see God just, heart, his heart just appealing to people, you know. Next, we come to the feast of booths, also known as the feast of tabernacles, or the Jews would refer to it as Sukkoth. And the Lord, verse 33, spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel, saying, on the 15th day of his, of this seventh month, Notice there's another, uh, here in the seventh month, another, another feast. And then for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. And he goes on to kind of back up here a little bit and says, now these are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices, and drink offerings, each on its proper day, besides the Lord's Sabbaths, and besides your gifts, and besides all of your vow offerings, and besides all of your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. Now he's going to give more specifics on the last feast that he mentioned, the Feast of Tabernacles. On the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the anointed feasts of the Lord. And the purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles is given there in verse 43, that your generations may know that I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is one of those reminders. You guys remember that the, the picture of Israel in Egypt? That's a picture for you and I of being in slavery to sin because Israel was in slavery in Egypt. So coming out of Egypt is a picture of being re re released from slavery to sin when we come and when we accept Jesus as our savior. But there are all these commemorative feasts to remind them, I brought you out of that. I brought you out of that. Boy, you know, I think, and, and, and it's kind of cool because they almost kind of got to go camping for like a week. Which is neat. I guess if you don't like camping, it's probably not such a great thing. But, you know, I, I imagine, you know, leaving their home in some cases might be kind of a challenge. But, but, but think about what it would take to do that. If, if, if we said, okay, we're going to commemorate you being saved. And to do that, we're going to remind you that God brought you out of slavery and for seven days, we're just going to focus on the fact that God brought you out of that enslaved position you were in because you were in slavery to, to sin, right? You were in slavery to your own flesh. And God set you free from that when you accepted Jesus as your Savior. So wouldn't it be cool if we just took seven days 
once a year and just remembered? Went camping and just remembered every single day, you know, with some kind of a sacrifice. And we still offer sacrifices. Again, they're us. But, but with, you know, we offer to the Lord another part of ourselves every part of that day. And we just remember, Lord, you brought me out of slavery. And you're thinking about the way you lived in Egypt. Again, that symbolic picture of sin. How did you live when you lived in sin? What kind of things did you, what kind of things engrossed you or, or, or what kind of things did you fixate on when, before you came to Christ? What did he deliver you from? What addictions, what issues, what uh, challenges, you know? You would spend the week remembering all of those things and remembering, but you wouldn't remember them so as to kind of exalt them or highlight them, you would remember them for the purpose of understanding that you'd been brought out from that thing, okay? Now, one of the big things you know that I was delivered from when I came to Christ was a horrific marriage. Sue and I just had a very, very bad marriage, and we both gave our hearts to Christ, and he began to do a work of healing and restoration and so forth, uh, which has gone on to this day and continues to go on, but the point is, that would be part of what I would be spending that seven days remembering is God, you brought me out of and just remembering how yucky it was. I mean, how ugly it was and how that relationship with my wife was so raw and painful and dirty, you know, and creepy. Just remember, say, God, you, you, you drew me out of that. You pulled me out of that. And it doesn't mean we have a perfect relationship today, but it reminds me, that's what I've been released from. That's what I've been brought out of. Sometimes we forget. You know, we've been saved so that we can be Christians, but you've also been saved out of something. You've been saved out of a lifestyle of slavery. You know? Oh, man. I just think taking a week to, to do that would probably be a good thing. You know, let's go camping for a week and just remember what God delivered us from. All the things he delivered us from each. Wouldn't it be cool just to get together with a group of people and, and every night somebody brings up, you know, around the campfire, you know, something's like, well, God delivered me from anger, you know, and somebody says, you know, God delivered me from drugs and alcohol, you know. Somebody else says, you know, God delivered me from fear. I used to just be so fearful, you know. And somebody else says, you know, yeah, this or that. And, thing. and we just praise God that we've been brought out of slavery. I just, I just think that's incredibly cool. Let's try to, let's get through this last chapter very quickly here in the time that we have left. It's chapter 24. Um, the last chapter that we're going to deal with here tonight starts with some comments made about some of the daily and weekly care of the tabernacle. First is related to the lampstand. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil from beaten olives for the lamp, the that a light may be kept burning regularly outside the veil of the testimony in the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall arrange it from evening to morning before the Lord regularly, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And he shall arrange the lamps of the, on the lampstand of pure gold before the Lord regularly, meaning ongoingly. It's a regular sort of a process that took daily administration for the priests. What was the lamp all about? What was the lamp? Remember, it was outside the, the, the veil, so it was in the, the, the holy place. But it was there as a picture of the light of Christ, who Jesus said, I am the light of the world, right? It is, it is that picture of the Holy Spirit flowing also in our lives, whereby Jesus said to us, uh, uh, you know, now you are the light of the world. And it's, it's, it's the beauty of that light that doesn't go out, right? Right? that keeps burning, and they were told to keep that lamp burning. It's the presence of God in our lives. Oh, I love the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our lives, you know? And that lamp is a picture of just his incredible, warm, lighted 
presence in our lives that does not end. Verse 5, you shall take fine flour and bake 12 loaves from it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each loaf, and you shall set them in two piles, six in a pile, on the table of pure gold before the Lord. This is the table of showbread. And you shall pour, uh, put pure frankincense on each pile, that it may go with the bread as a memorial portion, as a food offering to the Lord. Every Sabbath day, Aaron shall arrange it before the Lord regularly. In other words, it's replaced every Sabbath. It is from the people of Israel as a covenant forever. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, since it is for him a most holy portion out of the Lord's food offering, a perpetual due. And again, this had to be replaced uh, once a week on the Sabbath, the bread was removed, the old bread and the new bread was put there, some nice, hot, wonderful smelling loaves of bread. And um, the bread of the presence provides a beautiful picture of Jesus, again, the bread of life, with whom we sup, with whom we fellowship, uh, with whom, and, and, and who is our true sustenance. He is always present in our lives, uh, the bread of life, and we feed upon him. Uh, now, at this point, there's kind of an interruption in the flow, and this narrative is inserted. It says in verse 10, Now an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, so this kid is, is half Jewish, half Egyptian, went out among the people of Israel. Then the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp. So they kind of, sounds like they came to blows or had an altercation. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed. Then they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shelemeth, the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody till the will of the Lord should be clear to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And that's a very serious and severe uh, sort of a sentence for this man. But before it takes place, the Lord instructs them further on such things. And speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall stone him. And the sojourner, as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. By the way... This passage right here is the one the Jews would point to when they tried to stone Jesus because they believe he was blaspheming when he would say things about his relationship to the father. Let me show you a passage on the screen from John. It says in John chapter 10, beginning of verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the father. For which of them are you going to stone me? And the Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are go going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, in other words, being a mere man, make yourself God, meaning you declare your equality with God. And um, they believed that that was an act of blasphemy and that it was then to be punished by uh, death by stoning. You know, um, the Jews went to some really wild lengths to avoid saying or writing, even writing the name of God, um, because in their thinking, you couldn't blaspheme God's name if you didn't ever say it. <laughs> That's the way they thought, you know, it's like, I'm never going to blaspheme God's name if I never, you know, say his name. So they didn't allow themselves to say it. In fact, the high priest was the only one who was allowed to say God's name and he would only say it once a year. And the high priest would pass that pronunciation along to the next high priest, his successor. Usually, he would try to, they would try to get it from on his deathbed. Literally, as he's breathing his last, he would speak to one of his sons and say, it is pronounced, and thus and such. And that's one of the reasons why we have such confusion today over the actual pronunciation of uh, the name of the Lord as it is given in the Scripture we don't know, you know, we say Yahweh, 
Yahweh, could be Yehovah. You know, and a lot of people like to say, well, I know exactly the way it's supposed to be pronounced. And we don't. And they're just being arrogant. And we don't. We don't know. It's because the Jews didn't even know. <laughs> you know, the high priest would know, and he'd pass it along to the high priest. And then pretty soon when the high priest stopped being the high priest and functioning in that role, it just, it was just, it was a, it was a lost sort of a thing. But, you know, the Jews were so weird about this, they wouldn't even write um, the name of the Lord uh, because th they wouldn't even write, they wouldn't even write God you know, on, on paper, because they believed that if somehow that paper was destroyed, that would be blaspheming the name to live. If, if, you know, of course, and paper's going to be eventually destroyed, but they thought that was tantamount to blasphemy. So instead, uh, um, they would write the word for Lord instead uh, of, of God. And that, that is the word uh, Adonai. Uh, so, and they would use things like when, when it came and you see it right here. Uh, instead of saying his name, they would call him the name. They'd refer to him as the name. Do not blaspheme the name, you know, um, instead of actually referring to him. Again, do you see the fear? Do you see the fear and trepidation? And uh, we are not, you know, we don't, we don't operate under that. In fact, we are given the name of Jesus uh, to use in prayer. And as we call upon his name, Jesus said, up to this point, you've never asked for anything in my name. Now ask that you may receive. And that's why we ask in the name of Jesus. Um, and by the way, in the name of Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that we always amend our prayers with in Jesus name. Amen. We do that, but that's not exactly what that means. That's a rather legalistic way of thinking about it in the name means by his authority. Okay. If I were to, if, if I needed to get a message to Brandon, but I couldn't get to Brandon, this is the old days before cell phones and all that sort of thing. I might send a message through uh, someone who I trusted. And I would say to this person, now you, here's the message that I'm giving you to give to Brandon. And I'm wanting you to give it in my name. And so that messenger would come to Brandon and he would say, I'm here to give you a message in the name of Paul. And then he would proceed to give the message. And Brandon would know that, there, that my authority was behind it because the messenger used the name of authority from, you know, from the original thing. So that's how we're to pray. We're to pray using the authority of Jesus' name. So we come before the Lord and we say, by the authority that is granted to me, by the name of your son, I ask this or I pray for this or whatever. We go before the Lord in his authority. We literally have his stamp because your name in those days was a stamp and, you know, you give somebody your name as a stamp signifying that you have authority. In those days, the kings would put their stamp on a seal, on a message. And that stamp was the crest of the king. And people would look at that stamp and they would say, that's a message from the king. This is not some, you know, false message. I can see that it's his because his stamp is on it. Well, we've been given the stamp. Isn't that cool? of Jesus Christ. And, and it's now it's not something that you and I can wield according to our whims. The Bible says, we know that as we ask according to his will, he hears us. We're to operate in his name according to his will. You know, but we still have been given this incredible privilege of operating freely in his name. It's not something we fear. It's a, it's a precious privilege and responsibility. Okay, verse 17, let's finish up here. Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good, life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Now stop there for just a moment. This isn't absolute. This wasn't a situation where... People think about this eye for eye, tooth for tooth thing as an absolute law in the land where, you know, you bust my tooth, I have to bust your tooth. What this was doing in Israel, you guys, was it was limiting the kind of 
award that might be given someone who'd been wronged. In other words, you kill my goat, I can't kill your child. You right? You with me? If you kill my goat, all I can get back from you is your goat. If you, if you gouge out my eye, the worst I can do to you is gouge out your eye. Now, it doesn't mean I have to go and gouge out your eye. I can certainly forgive you, and forgiveness was always the high road. God put an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth to limit punishment so that it was, it was compensatory compensatory is that the word so that it was in keeping with whatever had been done you burned down my house right I can't kill your family in retribution this is called the law of retribution the law of balance in retribution so um, verse uh, 22 is that where I am you shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native, for I am the Lord your God. And so there's those instructions given regarding the law of retribution. And then Moses spoke to the people of Israel, and they brought out, the camp, uh, out of the camp the one who had cursed and stoned him with stones. Thus the people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. And that's where we stop for tonight. So, yeah, wow. Wow, right? I mean, you know, you, you, you practically get tired. You know, I, I get tired reading through the book of Leviticus. I mean, it's, it's exhausting, you know, because, um, man, I'm glad I don't live under that system. I, I'm just so, so glad. But I do see the holiness of God. I do see that, and that's something I need to maintain. And I see these wonderful, glorious celebrations and ceremonies that God established as reminders for the people of Israel. And I think, wow, we could do well incorporating some of those into our practice just to remember God's goodness in our lives.